Good evening, and welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum. This is another in a series of civic forums we're going to be holding, actually we have held, uh, before election for you guys to sit and get yourself up to speed on who the candidates are and what the issues are. All of them are really interesting and well worth watching. We hope you do watch them all. All of the candidates for the House and all of the candidates for the Senate and Bill Fraser coming in speaking of the parking garage bond and speaking of the sewer bond. And tonight we have a candidate for state Senate. We have Andrew Perchlick. And I'm right. pleased to have you. Well, thanks for having me. This is great. It's a good service for the community. Would you tell people who is Andrew Perchlick? <laughs> uh, what part of the community do you live in? Uh, I live on Franklin Street here in Montpelier, uh, kind of behind the middle school. But I've only lived there for about a, a year. And even part of that year kind of off and on as we were transitioning. We, I've lived in Marshfield, Vermont for 20 years prior to that. And I lived in Orange County, and I also, when I first moved to Vermont, lived in Addison County. When did you first move to Vermont? It was 95, 1995. I finished the Peace Corps in Panama, and the woman I wanted to get married with was, was living here, and she was the VISTA leader of a fuel assistance program out of Rutland County. But there was an opening for Addison County, so she said, come out here, I can... I can get you a, a job as a VISTA volunteer, in the, and I wanted to do energy stuff. I always wanted to do renewable energy stuff, and this was at fuel assistance, but it was close enough, and I got to be with her. So I moved out with her to Hubberton, Vermont, which is in Addison County, and I worked on a program just focused on Addison County on fuel assistance, which was a good experience for me. I'd been spent some time in Vermont in the past. I'm from Colorado originally, but I'd come out here to do an internship uh, with an environmental group one summer. And that's where I had met my wife originally. Uh, and I had done the outdoor recreation and things that are very popular for, for young people that come to Vermont. But I hadn't really met a lot of real Vermonters. So that summer, I met, or that year that I was a VISTA volunteer, met a lot of folks that were struggling to make ends meet and that found winter kind of a scary time. It wasn't a time that they were going to go skiing. It was a time that they worried whether they're going to be able to pay their fuel bill or their fuel or their feed bill. You know, are they going to get, you know, food and other things that they need. And so that was a great experience just and I've carried I've stayed in the energy world basically the whole time since. So what is the energy world? Well, <laughs> We're all in the energy world. Yeah, we all use energy, but I've been working in different types of clean energy in Vermont since or just shortly after that job when I moved to this part of the to the state. But I've taken so I've even I've working on renewable energy and developing the renewable energy industry in the state. Now, what is the renewable energy industry beyond solar? So it's all the renewable energy technologies, solar, wind, hydro, biomass, which has different uh, parts to it. Um, some people could, would include energy efficiency in there. I haven't really worked on that as much, but I've you know, been par part of that world when I worked for the state. But I've always carried what I've learned in that, in Addison County about people difficulties on paying their energy bills. And that, that, that's important when we're promoting renewable energy that we don't forget that there's some people that are having a very difficult time to pay their energy bills. And I think one of the good things about renewable energy is that you do pay more upfront, or at least that's traditionally the way it's been. The costs are coming down to where more, they're even more competitive. But over the long term, they're very stable. And I think they will be lower and better for the Vermont economy than, than importing fossil fuels. Do you see hydro playing a bigger role, or what is the future role of hydro? I, there's, I don't see it playing a bigger role. We already have basically you know, developed all the rivers that are kind of developable, if you want to think. There are some small examples. There'll be maybe some small projects built here or there. There was a, a new project built in Bennington a few years ago. So we might find some small projects here or there, run a river type projects. And we might buy a little or a little less or a little more from Hydro-Quebec, but I don't see a big change because we don't want to get too much from one source just because you want a diversified portfolio of energy. So I don't see a lot of gain in, in hydro, but we could do some efficiencies of the existing plants. Were you involved in the Ridgeline discussion? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> how has that played out in the State House compared to how you would like to have seen it play out in the State House? Um, I mean, I don't think it played out. I mean, it, it's still playing out. Yeah, and it didn't really play out too much in the state house. I mean, it was definitely an issue around the the local control, and there, there was some discussion in the state house. But I mean, I don't think it was a real 
uh, fruitful discussion the way, the way it played out in the State House a couple of years Why ago. Not? Well, we didn't really get anywhere. I mean, we, we had this new system where the towns have to do energy planning, um, and it's, it's a difficult lift for some of the towns and regions, and it isn't really clear on, on, on the, the, the kind of the, the value of that and the support for, for the towns to do all that kind of energy planning. I mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good effort. Doing planning is, is helpful. Um, but as far as the kind of the, the overall value of trying to get each town and each region to kind of think of the whole comprehensive energy plan and get all those to mesh with the state energy plan it, is a huge, huge lift. And I mean, maybe we'll work it out and it'll, it'll figure out. But I think there was just some, some clear people that didn't want wind uh, visible or up on a ridge lines. And I think it's, it should be a more, uh, uh, there should be a discussion about like, well, what do we want for our energy future and where could wind be and what are the real issues and is our permitting, if, if it's a problem about the environmental impacts of wind, what is it about our permitting system that isn't protecting that environment? And I think that was lost in the discussion. It was either like wind is bad and we don't want it or, or it's good. And, and I think there could be a, a more detailed discussion about what the benefits are and how we can build wind projects in the state that have local support and support the local economy and support our energy goals and these other things. But it seemed it got to be to where people didn't want to have a discussion about it. It, was, it became a very binary yes, no discussion. Was there somewhere lurking in the background the question of external companies, big wind companies coming into the states versus local companies? That was often the way it was portrayed as like, oh, we don't want big international companies to, to own these. But I think that was more of a rhetorical point to make it less palatable. I mean, it's, we have large corporations doing a lot of other things that you don't, that you don't hear that complaint about those well, things. Well, don't we hear that in the solar? Yeah, and you do well, hear that, that there are external major companies coming right. in, and you hear about the, the, it's because it, Vermonters, luckily, and I support this. We want local things. We want local agriculture. We don't want factory farming and big agricultural companies mm -hmm. moving here. In the uh, cannabis legalization debate, I a lot of people say like, we don't want large <laughs> companies here to you know control the cannabis market. Uh, and it's, it's it's like you had mentioned before we were live about not having a McDonald's or a Starbucks or a Walmart in Montpelier. Uh, people like that, but there's the, 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 the problem that we had with wind power is like, well, if you don't have a large company do it, if you wanna do local, small owned wind power, it's gonna be a lot more expensive. And for many, many years, us that were advocating for wind energy were saying like, this is a good thing for the long term, we should invest in renewable energy. But people said, well, it's not, it's too expensive. We're not going to do it work because it's going to cost too much and it's going to raise rates. Well, we figured out how to make it cheaper than new natural gas and fossil fuel energy. But now it's like, well, no, it's not that it's too expensive. Now that it's cost effective, it's that we don't want large corporations to own it. So you're saying the goalposts keep moving. Yeah, a little bit. Now, when you're talking about land use in terms of planning and the like, you walk into Act 250. And yeah. Act 250 is our, our long suffering land use policy. Does Act 250 work in your field? I think so. I mean, I wouldn't say or it's would suffering. would you tweak with it? Well, I would wouldn't say it's it? suffering. I think it's been a successful law. There, I know there's people that want to tweak it. I haven't really spent the time to like study what those tweaks are and to determine whether they're good or bad, but I think it's been Is the process successful. too lengthy? It can be, and I think it's the same with like wind projects. When you do something that's controversial, it can be even be a parking lot or it can be a parking garage. Uh, if if people don't like it, and you, but you want to have participation of locals, then it can Is that be the like price you're paying for local yeah. participation. So there are different. I'm sure there's projects you can point to and say, look how much trouble this developer had to develop this, and so the whole system needs to be changed. But there are probably other examples where they sailed through in the minimal amount of time, and everybody was happy with the project. So it really depends on more the project than I think the, the process. But if there's, if there's fixes to be made, I'm supportive of looking at those. And well, let's, talk, let's continue on local input. Okay. Um, schools, consolidation. Well, that was a major issue yeah. in the last legislature. It will continue to be an issue. How do you stand on that? Because that's another one of those questions yeah. of local versus state good. Yeah. 
And I support local control. I think that communities should be the ultimate deciders of, of their schools. But I understand that we have a statewide budget system for the schools, and even though it's not completely disconnected, though you know voting on local schools has some impact. Uh, I think I think a community needs to have ultimate control over their schools, and there has been there have been communities that have shut down their schools on their own. They've decided like this isn't really good for our kids. It's there's only four kids in the class. Like, does that really make sense? And I think it's they're smart enough. The local people in these towns are smart enough to decide when the school is too small, and they could vote to shut it down. And they have in some instances. Well, what if they don't? Uh, do you right. favor forced consolidation? I don't. Which is I, what Act 46 was really about. Yeah, although they, they, they kind of say it's not, but they want to save the money. And I think I, I agreed with the consolidation of the supervisory unions because that, I think, just made sense. And it saved some money and maybe some bureaucratic uh, effort. But when the, when the supervisory unions merge and then that forces some towns just not to have the control, that's, that's, that's their lays in the problem. And they'll say, like, well, we're not combining the supervisory union so that we can close these schools, but that might be the result. And how do you, how do you mesh with that? And I haven't really figured that out, like a lot of people. Can, can, you, can you do both? And I'm hopeful that there, there is a way. Well, in Maine, you have one supervisory district per county. Mm -hmm. Would 14 supervisory districts be totally out of the pale for you? No, I haven't heard the argument, but it, like just on the face of it, it doesn't. I don't see the only the only problem that I would see is well, does that further dilute local control? I guess it depends well, it on would, what. You know, obviously. I mean, so if if the supervisory unions can just decide which schools are closed and which schools stay open, then that's an issue. But as far as the just day-to-day -day administration of schools and providing education, I don't have a problem with consolidating all that into county supervisory unions, for example. I, I don't see a problem there, but I see a problem with taking away control from some communities that have their own kind of alternative regulation method. They have a plan to, to change their school over time. They're very involved, you know, the community and the volunteers and working on the school. Mm -hmm. Well, you could maybe save a little bit money for the taxpayers, but maybe that's short-term savings. Maybe there's a, other costs. Uh, I think it should be a more democratic decision of, of, the, of the people in those communities. Isn't there an argument to be made that economies of scale, when you have more students clustered in a classroom, you have a greater opportunity to offer advanced placement, to do different kinds of right. scheduling options that really become difficult as you end up with right. micro classes. And I think that a, a should be a decision of the, those communities because some people like small classes. Some people don't think it's more beneficial for their children or their children in their community to have to travel the distance, for the parents to have to travel to go to any extracurricular activities, for the child to be able to take advantage of some of the advantages because they have to get home and they live 45 minutes away or something like that. Now you've lived in Addison, you've lived in Marshfield, you've lived out there in the outers. Yeah, and it's so to speak. right, and it might not seem that far, but it's like 45 minutes on the beginning and end of every day. Uh, and, and for elementary schools, how much time is an appropriate time to put a six-year-old on a school bus? And if communities can talk about that, I think it's, it's better for the, the local community. So I agree with you, there is economies of scale for cost, but is cost the only metric that we're looking at? But there's at? also economies of scale for instruction as well that you can offer many different class offerings if you have more students. Right, but is there, are you also, is there a counter argument that? There always is. Yeah. And so uh, that's, that, I like that decision being made more locally. And I think one of the things I support is a shifting of school education to the income tax. And rather I th than the property tax. Rather than property Why? tax. or, or comp So the reason is that it's a fair, can be a fair system. Even though we have the income sensitivity uh, still, there's a disparity on the percentage of income that people pay towards education. You know, some people might only be paying one percent, and other people may make three percent or more of their their income based on on that. And I think another reason, because we and we have a good progressive income tax, it it will kind of reduce some of this issues of you know the, the where the money's coming from from each community and their property tax and the property tax bill being. So high. But we've done that already with the state pool, the state education pool, so that those people in the NEK where the prices are very low, right, right. 
you know, are basically pitching in the same as the people in Stowe, and that's been a, a bone of contention in Stowe and Killington right, for years. Right, yeah, and, and other towns that are, right. that are su supporting that. And, and um, you know, I don't know if there's a way to get away with that and still have the equity that I think we want. And if we want to have rural economic development, we need to have schools in these rural economic area, rural areas, and and those schools will be more expensive on a per pupil. But I don't think just expense should be the only metric that we're looking at when we're looking at the the well-being of our children. The unified teachers contract uh, for health benefits that was discussed and hashed out last year. What's your feeling on that? The low, taking local right. control over the health care cost and getting it clustered into a statewide pool. Yeah, I mean, I don't know a lot about it, but I definitely heard from from teachers and families that saying that they they didn't like it, but they felt like it was it was something that was doable and they kind of feel like it's going to be a, a death of a thousand cuts of, of reduction of, of benefits. I, I, I don't I'm not one of those people that think teachers get paid too much or, or anything like that. I think we need to support them as, as much as we can and, and providing good health coverage is, is essential to that and that should be for all workers. I, I mean, ideally we'd get away from healthcare being connected to employment. Um, I mean, I, I didn't like the way it was kind of proposed by the governor at the end of that last session and things like that. Um, it seems like after they changed how it was going to be implemented, then, then the teachers were more supportive of the transition. Um, there was some savings, if, if I understand correctly, so that's, you know, you can't argue against savings, but it was a deduction of, of the benefit to, for the teachers, which is not something that I would try to do. And it was also taking away a bargaining control on the local level from those boards. Yeah, but, but I understand that they were they, they got to the point of okay with that because the way the state system was set up so that they still had you know, a fair representation on the state, statewide level. Let's stay at the end of the session in education. There was, there was one more factor that came in right at the end when they were talking about, I think it was a 50s, oh, it was $34 million surplus, and the teacher's retirement came up. Mm -hmm. That's sitting beneath the surface of yeah. a balanced budget every year yeah. and growing worse and worse and getting pushed and kicked down the road. Right. What's your feeling on that? Right. Well, I don't how, know if it's getting do do worse, but it may well, be. Well, you have more teachers retiring. Right, but I don't know as far as the, the actuarial the fun, Yeah, it, like is the is the is it keeping up or is it actually are we losing ground? I know we have a deficit as far as what the actuaries Large say deficit. we need to have in that fund how to would pay you, it. How would you propose closing that deficit? To I mean, I I well, I agreed with the legislature and with the treasurer Pierce that we needed to put that money in there and that that'll pay off that'll save us interest costs over the long term that more. So it's like. I can't remember the numbers, but I think the treasurer was saying something. We put $34 million in this year. It's going to save us $134 million right, right. over time. But we still have that, that obligation down the road with infrastructure sitting as another one. Uh, you're not going to get more federal funds for, for bridges and roads. Right, but we should. We should, but <laughs> sitting and waiting for that is possibly waiting for a moment that just won't come. Right. How do we finance our infrastructure here? Do we raise our gas tax again? Do we just let it let it go? Yeah, uh, it definitely infrastructure is is the kind of investment that I want to see government make. I think that's the role of government making investments in these things that take a long term to pay off. Uh, same with like human capital or investing in our small children. That's an investment. It, that'll pay off in 20 years when these two-year-olds become 22-year-old workers and that are productive members of the society. The same with our infrastructure. If we like improve our our wastewater and our roads and everything, now that's going to pay off over over the long term. Um, I, I don't have a, a magical answer about where the additional funds will come from, but I'm somebody that is willing to, to roll up my sleeves and work across the aisle and work different people that have different ideas and come up with the best solution that raises the prosperity of all Vermonters but also tries to meet the, the needs that we have and, and makes the tough choices of prioritizing it. We, we might not be able to, to do every single thing that we want to do. I mean, as a candidate, you go around and you hear a lot of things about what we want changed. Um, and it's usually things that are gonna take more money. 
and how you prioritize those things is is a key issue of the of legis of the legislature and of the people and making those decisions. You're uniquely positioned to explain to the listeners what the so-called carbon tax is. Can you explain to people <laughs> what the so-called carbon tax? Well, there is isn't do? there isn't a one. Or, or the one that you understand. Well, it could be anything. You know, you could do something just like you said, like add a certain amount of, of tax to gasoline because gasoline is a, a has a lot of carbon in it. It has a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. So by raising the price of that, you'll have revenue that you could use to reduce greenhouse gases. And because it's more expensive, that sends a market signal to not to not use it. But basically, it's it's ta it's an idea that we should tax things that are bad, like pollution, and things that cause greenhouse gas, you know, climate change, uh, and we should promote goods. And, you know, there's, there was an effort years ago about this kind of tax shifting where you, you would tax fossil fuels or carbon and you would take that money and you'd support things like employment. So you'd reduce the, the employment tax, you know, the, the payroll tax. You know, that never was able to really gain, gain enough traction to get going. I mean, I definitely support efforts to to lower our greenhouse gases and increase our renewable energy economy in the state. And I think there's ways that we can do it that isn't just like a blunt tax on, on fossil fuels that is regressive. You know, the low, lower income people, like I said, when I lived in Addison County and worked with folks that had trouble paying their fuel bills, uh, just a flat tax on heating fuel is gonna hurt them more than, than you know, wealthier folks. Uh, so there's there's ways that we can do that to where we can grow the economy and 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 focus the efforts on local, like you talked about with the wind energy. What kind of local renewable energy projects can we have uh, that are going to lower our greenhouse gas emissions and support the local economy, but not be a burden on on the low income and those folks that are having trouble meeting their their heating bills or their electric bills. And we have some programs in place for for these things, but they're like the weatherization program is underfunded. We're not meeting our goals there. How would you fund it more? What, is there a revenue source that you could see that would target towards weatherization? Yeah, well, we, right now it's, uh, there, is a, there is a tax on fuel oil for heating fuels that goes to, to weatherization. And I think we could, we could definitely look at that and, and how that tax is structured and can more money be there. And we get some federal money too. And like you said, we don't wanna wait till we get more federal money, but I think as far as the federal budgeting things, it should be a higher priority. But yeah, that, that's the way it's taxed now. Could that be changed to where there's more money for weatherization? Could it be taxed on the, on the, the carbon content to where it's, so, so if you're heating with wood, you're not gonna pay the tax. Uh, and I think there's these ways that we should transition to renewable fuels that aren't hurting our current infrastructure and our current employees. So there's fuel dealers that sell fossil fuel today and they might be opposed to something that raises the price of fossil fuels, but if you can give them incentives and give their customers incentive to advance wood heating, which is local fuel, then they could be supportive of that. And that's that's that, that's a win-win. Right now, even though the local fuel dealer gets paid, 80 cents of every dollar we spend on heating fuel leaves the state. But if you're buying wood heat, whether it be chips, pellets, cordwood, 80 cents of that stays in the state and helps our whole forest product industry and our whole effort to keep forests as forests. So that's, those are the things I'm more interested in doing. And some things might be uh, an increase of a fee or a tax. Uh, you know, I'm not uh, dogmatic like, like the governor saying, just absolutely no revenue increase. I think we're gonna have to look at, at creative ways of, of raising some revenue to do some of these programs. But spending some of that revenue on making sure that the lowest income folks are not the governor the talks it. about um, no new no new revenue, no new fees. He mm -hmm. also talks about cuts. Is there anything where you can see grabbing more efficiency in state governments so that you can use those already existed dollars and shift them over? I, I, I don't. I don't have like a, a quick answer for that, but I'm, I'm willing to look and investigate ideas or uh, people that have proposals so say like you know here's a way that we can move things over here's here's an idea that we could do i know i i read the auditor's report on their economic development programs and i uh, kind of agree with him that sometimes we're doing economic development what i call just economic development for the sake of economic development without being a targeted um, so 
I don't know if I would just grab that money and put it towards something else, but maybe it could be used better and maybe there are parts of that. But I think any anything that that would be there would be small. It's like moving $3 million here to there. And a lot of the problems that we have, like Lake Champlain cleanup are I really- I was going to get there. That that was passed by the legislature and had no funding. Yeah. It's a, and, a, and a lot of people will say and that they really want to see the, the money go to, to make the lakes cleaner. It's an economic development issue. It's an environmental health issue. We need to have our waterways safe and clean. And it's the same with with education and healthcare and childcare. We want to see it happen, but it's going to take X millions of dollars a year. And where's that money going to come from? And bringing our prisoners back from Mississippi. Right. And, right. And so do we need to build a new prison or can we find a way to have other savings? I know, you know, uh, the Hallquist as, as a candidate has talked about it, but I remember, uh, I think Howard Dean was talking about it too. Is like, how can we reduce our current budget in corrections that, so that we can save money to move into other priorities? Because nobody says actually, that's Actually, Jim Douglas priority. was actually talking about yeah. that as well. Right, yeah, so uh, Dean, Douglas, <laughs> like, it, 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 I think it's every, every new administration sees the large corrections budget but and says, like, can't there be money movement? there has been some movement. Yes. Uh, during Dean, during Scott, there's been some movement to rejigger the laws so that non, uh, non-violent offenders yeah. are not going into prisons. Uh, right, and we've made some success with the uh, marijuana decriminalization What's and things like that. What's the next step in that? Last legislature was decriminalized, partially legalized. Yeah. Where do you see the next step? I'm assuming we're gonna... As Quebec now offers marijuana. Right, in all and of Maine Canada. And, and yeah, Massachusetts. and Massachusetts and Maine. and. And I don't know. You, you would think New Hampshire, as live free and die, would would get there, but they're they're you, they want to live free unless it involves buying marijuana, I guess. But but I think marijuana is going to be a, a Where, if you're tax sitting and in the regulated system. What, I would vote would you... for a tax and regulate system. Uh, would have to you know get into the details about how it's regulated and taxed. I think w- one of my main issues is I agree with those people that say that we got to be careful about it. Uh, we don't want to have a, a system where we're relying on the funding of other programs to to encourage people to buy more marijuana and use more marijuana so that we could fund other programs. Uh, it's the same with like cigarette taxes or alcohol taxes. Uh, there, there are health issues that we have to be aware of. And so I think that at the, we need to be careful as we're getting into this that the money first goes to education and and health issues around the use of these drugs to make sure that that's dealt, adequately dealt with and we're not taking money away to put towards our corrections budgets, for example, which should be, should be used for, for those things first. But then there, it could be that there is gonna be other money available and that could go to other priorities, whether it be anything, childcare, healthcare, what it could be. What about the prescription drug problem, uh, opioids in Vermont? Is that being addressed correctly in your view? Is there something the state could do that they're not right. doing that you would advocate? I think they're, I think it's just a, it's another funding question. I mean, from, from what I see is for, from the, the law enforcement side, I think, you know, from like the prosecutors and things, they're, they're, they're trying to figure it out. They don't want to just throw people in jail that are just have a medical issue of being, it's, it, being addicted to these things. And there's drug courts and other things that, they're, that I think are successful. Uh, it's pr- I think sometimes it's just a funding issue. Uh, we don't have enough funding for mental health care. When I went door to door talking to people, it was probably the number one story that people would tell me when the, about their connection to state government. They didn't know who was running, they didn't know that there was an election, but they knew they had a nephew or a cousin or a brother-in-law that had either a mental health issue separate from drugs or a drug addiction slash mental issue that they couldn't get help for that their, their loved one would go and ask for help, would go to the state and say, I need help. And they'd say, okay, we can give you an appointment in four months or six months. Or that they're, they're, they knew somebody that was addicted and they f- just couldn't get help. They would, it wasn't, there, there wasn't enough slots for, for them in the programs that we have. So I think the state's idea of here are these good programs, we have good programs, but there's just not enough staff funding to bring in as much need. And one thing, that I'm interested in looking at is, is there a way to go after the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies that profited from recklessly marketing these opioids? Can, can, we, 
can uh, Attorney General, you know, get exactly. money out of them so that we can can put money towards the treatment that that's needed because they profited it from it and it was clear on a national basis. I don't know if there's examples in Vermont, but on a national basis, there's really clear examples of them knowing that they were sending drugs that were just going on to the street and they were continuing to doing so because it was a very profitable. Would you, feel, let's stay on health. Okay. Um, the bill that allows Vermont with federal permission to buy and import drugs, prescription drugs from Canada, mm -hmm. good idea? Yeah, I think so. I mean, if it can, when you first brought up prescription drug problem, I thought you were gonna say the problem is that the price of prescription drugs that people pay, which is, is a big problem. And so anything that we can do to try to lower those costs, and if the, if, if the same company is selling that drug in Canada for a fraction of the cost that we pay here, uh, why wouldn't we do it that way? In terms of, of the cost of drugs, the so-called skinny health plans that are starting soon in some states that allow a person to buy, a re go back to the days of a very stripped down, low cost per month, high, right, deductible, high deductible plan deductible. that doesn't include mental health, doesn't include maternity care, doesn't include uh, a number of the benefits that Vermonters already in law have, right. but is much more affordable for people on that monthly. Would you favor skinny insurance? Well, skinny insurance is better than no insurance, but I don't say that, that wouldn't be the goal. You know, you don't want to get to the to this like be be if everybody had skinny insurance, it's like oh well, let's all declare victory and go home. That's that shouldn't be our goal. I well, mean, it I, also strip our actuarial pool of the healthier <laughs> people and and leave it with the less healthy and the elderly. Right. I mean. I, I favor a universal health care system, a single payer, Medicare for all, whatever you want to call it. I think it's difficult for Vermont. I think we, tr we, we tried and it's going to be difficult for, ever, for us to get there on our own. Um, maybe we could do it as a northeastern region or something like that. So we need to find ways that we can just improve the access and affordability of the health care system that, that we have. And I think there, there are groups and people uh, and, and physicians that that kind of have ideas on how we, we can get there and I'm, I'm willing to work with them on, on figuring that out. I don't really want to try to to reinvent the, the effort that we tried under the Shumlin administration just to do our own universal health care system. Uh, but I think it was worth trying and I'd like it. In the, um, in the State House, you had spoken process-wise, you had spoken about being cautious about marijuana and walking that in a cautious manner um, death with dignity took two sessions to pass. Mm -hmm. um, civil unions took several sessions, yeah. even after the Supreme Court had ruled on it. Right. Uh, gay marriage took two sessions and a veto override to pass. Right. What is your feeling on the gun, the gun group, the groups around the state who say, why the rush in the spring? Right. Was, was that a, a question of rushing something through our legislature without huh. real due process and without taking time to consider the consequences? I haven't, I haven't heard that argument, so I haven't looked at it. I wasn't involved in the debate. I was, didn't follow it. I, you know, I support. But had you been in the state Senate, you would have been in the Yeah, I would, have, I would have an answer for you, because I, I don't know if due process wasn't served. I don't know well, if they, they weren't heard. They would heard. say that, that due process, they would say in rushing it through, they really weren't heard. Right. Was it rushed through? I mean, I don't know. It went through very quickly compared to gay marriage, compared to civil right. unions, compared to marijuana. Yeah, but it, I guess the question is, is it at that same level? Like it, and they would say it was. They'd say it's, you know, a, it's a, a basic a, fundamental right. Right. It's like we're, we're, you know, changing the Constitution. We're like, this should and be. And they're in court right now saying that the right. Vermont and Constitution we'll see, was. Right. And the courts will tell us if they were right or not and whether it was unconstitutional and we'll abide by the, by the court rulings. I mean, I think, I think so. Oftentimes, you know, my, my time in the state house, people will either use that either way. They'll say it's it's being rushed and we got to slow down, or, or it's being slow walked. Right, or it's being slow walked, just depending on whether they like it like it or not. And I, uh, you know, I don't know if they were were doing one or the or the other. But I understand why. If you don't like the bill, that's definitely going to be a, a criticism. Let's put you in the state house, and you and I are speaking. Okay, six do. months. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And you and I are speaking six months hence. Yeah. We're speaking in June. Um, other than energy, what, what would you have been focusing in on 
uh, in those first six months. What's another policy interest? That yeah, my, my, my top priority I interest, because I think on energy, we ha have a good energy plan, we have a good renewable energy standard that's on track, it's gonna slowly ramp up, so we have good things on electricity. I don't think we really need to do much or anything on electricity other than just make sure we stay on track. There's stuff we need to do on transportation and on heating fuels, but that's that's a little different. But I think one of my, or my top you know, effort is around childcare crisis that we have in the state and really supporting that all of our children and family. So family leave needs to pass and, and either- How was it paid for? Well, it was paid for by, the, the bill that didn't, that got vetoed, that right, passed, right. was through a payroll from the, basically the employees paying a little bit in each fund to right, kind of right. create a fund. So that family leave, that's both for children and families, uh, increasing childcare, financial assistance, How's it paid for? There's a lot of things that that I'm not going to be able to tell you now how we're going to end up paying for them in six months because you know it's a I, legislature with a lot of voices. Yeah, I mean, I would I would like to 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 find those creative ways to find little things like, for example, I noticed I'm pretty sure that candy is not taxed sales tax if it's sold in grocery stores. If it's sold in a convenience store, it's taxed. Like, could, well, could we just add the sales tax to candy and have that money to go help support? children's health. You know, we, we have... Uh, As one side destroys children's health, one side... Right, it seems children's health. it could be, there's a connection in there at least in, in my mind. I don't know how much it's money that would It's the sugar tax, not the carbon tax. Yeah, and you know, so I would like to say in six months, we say like we really made some progress on, on support for our children and families in the state. And I think it's not only just because the human capital investment, but support for children today is gonna to be beneficial for a whole society in 20 years, but it's an economic development issue. If we wanna have young families move to Vermont, the $10,000 to, to move here to work remotely, it, it was a publicity stunt, what maybe had value in that regard, but it wasn't an actual economic development plan. But really saying, hey, come to Vermont, we have family leave, we will really have full care for, for your families and your children, and you're gonna find quality, affordable childcare. If we have people having to quit work that they love because they can't find affordable quality childcare, they're not gonna wanna stick around or they're not gonna have other kids. I have I talk to families that either this is their story, either, hey, I'm paying 40% of my income on childcare. And that's with two parents. If you're a single family person, it's gonna be more than that. And it's just, it's kinda of untenable. So they have to leave the workforce and then go into other We're directly programs. into the $15 per hour wage, minimum wage. You well, know, maybe. It's a trade-off between small businesses and people who are really skidding uh, along. Yeah. Where, where uh, do you stand on that one? On the $15? I yeah. mean, I think the, the, the one of the issues that I've learned in campaigning, because definitely I was somebody that said, like, we need to, I support raising the minimum wage. Uh, two things that I learned that, that are just interesting points on that is, I talked to child care centers or like the family child centers. It's like if we had to pay fifteen dollars, we we couldn't survive. And like you, the the state can't tell us we we're going to not we're going to level fund you. They've been level funded for the past ten years, even though costs have gone up and demand has gone up. Uh, but they haven't got any more money. So the state at one point said, like we're not giving you any money. We're actually giving you less money, uh, but you need to pay your workers more. So. We need to be able to, when we move to a $15 minimum wage, how do we deal with those kind of folks? Like if we can't also increase their state funding, uh, how, do we, how, do we, how do we deal it's with that? It's the trade-off that we've been talking about during these 40 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask one right. final question. Yeah. You're a Democrat, are you a Democrat progressive or progressive Democrat? How are you on the ballot? Yeah, I'm a Democrat slash progressive. What does that mean? <laughs> it means I, well, just technically, it means I got the nomination from both the Democratic Party and the Progressive Party. I ran in the Democratic primary uh, and got the most votes, and that's why I'm now one of the three Democratic you know, candidates. Uh, but then the Progressive Party didn't have anybody in their primary, so the party could uh, endorse candidate, so they en endorsed me and Anthony. I don't think there's a third one, and Anthony is a progressive Democrat, and that, I'm a Democrat That's exactly what I'm going to add. I'll and and most you. people don't know if there's a difference or don't care if there's is is a there difference. Is there a difference in your mind between those two parties? Um, not really. I mean, I mean, between the parties or the de delineation? I mean, I think there's a difference in, in the parties in that they're different parties, and I, and I believe in a benefit of a multi-party democracy, and I believe that the Democrats would benefit from having a stronger 
Progressive Party. And I think they're slowly coming around to that. I think in the past, when the Progressive Party was starting to, to rise, the Democrats saw it as a threat. Uh, but I think they see it now as how they could work together for common goals and that the Democrats would rather work uh, together with the progressives than, than with the Republicans. But I'm also supportive of a third, fourth party on the conservative side. I mean, we have a libertarian party in, in the state. Uh, we, should, we should be supporting all parties, and that's partly the reason that I'm both a Democrat and a progressive, because I believe in, in a multi-party democracy. 40 minutes are done. Wow, that went thank fast. Thank you so very much for being here, and thank, thank you. you for watching it. I hope that, as I say at the end of all of these, I hope you'll get out and vote on Election Day. Urge mm -hmm. your family, urge your neighbors to get out and vote, because it's really important. And watch the other series in these. Watch the House, watch the Senate, watch Bill. They're all good shows. Thank you for watching.